series organized by the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia. Today, we have the honor of hosting Professor Douglas Kellner, Distinguished Research Professor of Education, UCLA, who is here to deliver the much anticipated talk titled Culture Studies and Media Culture. We will be recording today's lecture and at the same time it is being live streamed for our audience and subscribers on YouTube. There will be a question and answer session at the end of Professor Kellner's talk and all of you are requested to kindly post your questions in the chat box, which will be then addressed to Professor Kellner. The lecture series is being organized under the guidance of a head of the department, Professor Simi Malotra. I request Simi ma'am to kindly deliver the welcome address and introduce Professor Kellner. Thank you. Professor Douglas Kellner, our esteemed speaker this evening, Professor Wright, and all others who have joined us from across time zones. I, on behalf of the Department of English here at Jamia Millia Islamia New Delhi, and our collaborating partner, Department of English and American Studies, University of Woodsburg in Germany, extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this Ministry of Education Spark supported distinguished lecture series. Friends, we are delighted to welcome you to the 11th lecture of this series, which is a part of the ongoing collaborative project on new terrains of consciousness, globalization, sensory environments, and local cultures of knowledge. We're extremely fortunate to have with us Professor Douglas Kellner, one of the leading academics of our times as our speaker this evening. It is indeed an honor and privilege for us to host Professor Kellner, and we're all eagerly waiting to hear him speak on culture studies and media culture. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Kellner and I thank him profusely for indulging us and for so readily agreeing to be a part of our series, even at this unearthly hour of the day. Thank you, Professor Kellner. I once again extend a very warm welcome to Professor Kellner and to all of you. And now it is my honor and privilege to introduce Professor Kellner formally, though he needs no introduction whatsoever here or actually anywhere. Professor Kellner is Distinguished Research Professor of Education at UCLA and is the author of many books on social theory, politics, history, philosophy, and culture, including Herbert Marcuse and the Crisis of Marxism and six edited volumes of the collected papers of Herbert Marcuse. His work in social theory and culture studies includes media culture, guys and guns amok, domestic terrorism and school shootings from the Oklahoma City bombings to the Virginia Tech massacre, and media spectacle, to name just a few. His interest in media and technology began in the mid 70s while he was a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Here, Professor Kellner studied the political economy of television, culminating in television and the crisis of democracy, the Persian and the Persian Gulf television war, as well as launching his own very successful alternative culture, public access television, uh, te uh, television cable TV show entitled Alternative Views. As with his theories of media images, um, Professor Kellner offers a dialectical approach to new technologies, highlighting their progressive and dem democratic potentials while also critiquing the undeniable reliability, uh, rely, re, sorry, undeniable reality of corporate interests that drive the technology's market. His work has become increasingly important for educators concerned with the role of media and technology in the classroom. Professor Kellner has focused, uh, has focused studies in education on explicating media literacy and the multiple literacies needed to critically engage with culture in the contemporary era. On this basis, he has called for a democratic reconstruction of education for the new digitized, mediated, global, and multicultural era. Professor Kellner has collaborated with a number of other authors. He collaborated with Stephen Best on an award-winning trilogy of books examining postmodern turns in philosophy, the arts, the sciences, and technology. In his recent work, he has increasingly argued that media culture has become dominated by forms of spectacle and mega spectacle. He's also contributed important studies of alter globalization processes and has always been concerned with counter hegemonic movements and alternative cultural expressions in the name of a more radically democratic society. He's known for his work exploring the politically oppositional potentials of new media and attempted to delineate the term multiple technoliteracies as a movement away from the present attempt to standardize a corporatist form of computer literacy. Most recently, he's published two books on American Nightmare, Donald Trump, Media Spectacle and Authoritarian Populism, and the American Horror Show, Election 2016, and The Ascent of Donald J. Trump, and with Jeff Share, The Critical Media Literacy Guide, Engaging Media and Transforming Education. Thank you so much, Professor Kellner, for being with us. 
We're all so eagerly looking forward to hearing you speak. And we really have no words to thank you with Professor Kellner for your generosity, not just with your time, but also with your scholarship. And we're indeed really, really grateful to you, Professor Kellner, and we're looking forward to listening to you. Over to you. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I think that was the best introduction that anyone's ever given oh. to a talk <laughs> I've given in the last 50 years, hundreds of talks. That was a wonderful summary of uh, my work. And I also uh, became aware that all the lectures I've been giving on Zoom are uh, part of my alternative media uh, project that goes back to a uh, public access uh, television show in the uh, 1970s and 80s in uh, Austin, Texas. And then when I came to UCLA, I did blog and internet activism. So I guess Zoom now is the way uh, globally to uh, communicate to uh, audiences all over the world. So I'm very grateful that you uh, invited me to a Zoom lecture since it's impossible in the COVID era to uh, travel uh, all over the world. So um, again, thank you for um, the invitation. And what I wanna do is to present an overview of my work on media culture and cultural studies. So first, let me say a few words about uh, media culture. Previously, we lived in an oral culture where our myths, our stories, our religion were all communicated through oral uh, culture. Actually, I uh, gave a lecture in the Ukraine just last week exactly on this topic, myth, story, and narratives. So uh, I gave a lecture on Homer, uh, who uh, is the teller of tales, who told all the Greek uh, myths. Uh, Virgil, who told the uh, Roman uh, myths and uh, history. Uh, in the medieval period, it was St. Augustine with the Christian, with the city of God and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica, which was a Christian mythology. Then it was a turn from the oral culture of the early pre-modern era and the medieval era to the modern era that is a book culture. And we have now national cultures that are print based where print literacy becomes fundamental to get educated. So I'm thinking of uh, Cervantes um, in uh, Spain with Don Quixote. I don't know if you can see behind me, but there's a little uh, statue of uh, Don uh, Quixote. In France, it was uh, Rabelais. Uh, it was Moliere. Moliere. Uh, in uh, England, of course, it was Chaucer, Shakespeare, uh, later uh, Charles Dickens, uh, the British, uh, American, all European uh, uh, cultures, uh, were transmitted through uh, the book, which became a global uh, technology. So everywhere, uh, book culture for centuries. Uh, you best can read this in Marshall McLuhan's uh, Gutenberg uh, uh, Gallery. And indeed, uh, McLuhan anticipates the third stage in cultural forms, the transition to electronic and uh, media. Uh, culture. And I'm arguing that more than ever, and this is again from a U.S. Uh, perspective, that we live in a media uh, culture where our stories, our myths, uh, our political ideologies, our cultural battles over race, gender, class, religion, they're all fought out in the uh, media, that it's popular film, television, music, and then more recently, the internet and uh, digital uh, culture and um, uh, literacies. So today it is media culture, again, primarily in the US, that shapes our world, that gives us our masculine, our feminine identities, that distinguishes between us and them. Uh, who our friends and uh, enemies are. 
Um, one of the most um, horrible media experiences I had was during um, the Reagan uh, era. That was a very right wing era, era when the film Rambo came out. And I was visiting, doing a, a call, um, conference in Boston. And I went to a showing early Saturday morning, working class culture. This theater was packed. And Rambo was this American, you know, guerrilla warrior fighting against the Russians and the Vietnamese. And he was this super macho guy. And as he was killing uh, Russians and Vietnamese, the audience was cheering Rambo, 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 and USA, USA. So this was uh, horrifying to me, spectacle of uh, American uh, nationalism. So that um, media culture shapes our politics, our view of the world, what we think is good and evil, um, right and uh, wrong. Uh, it promotes racism, sexism, homophobia, religious bias, or it can fight it. My argument is that media culture is a contested terrain. And here I differ from um, the Frankfurt School that initially influenced me that media culture was a domain of politics and ideology and cultural study. The Frankfurt School were German Jewish immigrants that include Herbert Marcuse, Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, Eric Fromm, who came to not, from Nazi Germany to the United States uh, as refugees from Hitler in the 1930s. And Adorno got a job with the Radio Research Project where he studied popular uh, music. Uh, I was told by uh, Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse, that Max Horkheimer loved to go to the movies every day. So Adorno, Horkheimer, Marcuse, and Lewenthal would go and see all the American uh, movies. And they wrote a uh, study, Adorno and Horkheimer, called The Culture Industry, that argued that basically uh, American radio, tele well, no TV yet, uh, radio, film, popular music, uh, the newspapers all conveyed American ideology, just like German media conveyed Nazi ideology. If you've seen uh, Leni Riefenstahl's uh, Triumph of the Will or Olympia, you see that uh, German film is celebrating fascism. Uh, there was even, um, well, there's a scene from the beginning of Triumph of the Will where Hitler is flying through the clouds in an airplane and they're playing Wagner's uh, Valkyrie music. He lands uh, in Nuremberg and is met by a Nazi crowd that cheers him. He goes to a stadium and gives uh, a rambling rap of Nazi ideology with its uh, anti-Semitism, et cetera. And I was very uh, scared during the uh, Trump era where I saw Donald Trump fly into a Southern city, Atlanta, Georgia, was met by an ecstatic crowd and then went to a big stadium and gave the same kind of nationalist, you know, right wing authoritarian, you know, quasi fascist uh, rap that uh, Trump was either consciously or unconsciously, you know, emulating the uh, Nazis. So you see how media culture is a contested terrain. And as for Trump, you could argue on one hand, he's a product of the media. Trump was only well known because he was a TV star who played a millionaire and was in the tabloid newspapers that were very uh, popular because of all of his marriages and divorces and all the scandals that were in there. People like that. It's entertaining. They like the millionaire. They like the guy that's anti-establishment. Uh, they, they like his, his racism, his rage, uh, et cetera. So it was only his media spectacle, his media celebrity that got Trump um, elected, but it also brought him down. People got sick 
of seeing uh, Trump. And then this January the 6th uprising that I saw uh, um, live on television. I watched this with my mouth wide open. This was a fascist coup d'etat, an attempt at a coup d'etat where these right-wing hordes uh, raced into the uh, Capitol. Well, of course, this excited Trump's base, but the majority of people thought this guy is really dangerous, et cetera. So anyway, uh, you see how media culture uh, determines the fate of nations. Now, I could say the same thing with uh, the civil rights movement in a more popular vein uh, for decades, for centuries, uh, African-Americans were oppressed first as uh, slaves, and then in a system in the South of integration, or sorry, of segregation, where you had separate schools for Blacks, whites. Blacks couldn't go into churches, movie houses, et cetera. And I lived in my middle school era in uh, Virginia that was right on the Southern uh, border, uh, although I, uh, came from New York and California uh, originally. So I saw, you know, the, the prejudices that Southern people uh, had and, you know, the uh, battle over uh, civil rights. Most of the people around where I lived worked for the U.S. government or the military or CIA or State Department. So they tended to be more liberal. But you could see old time Southerners that were more uh, uh, reactionary. Well, I argue that media culture presented a, an attack on racism, just as it had racist images in Hollywood film and early years of American television. The news clippings of Martin Luther King and the civil rights uh, movement, people getting beaten up uh, during uh, marches. Uh, right-wing policemen, dogs, um, Black people getting lynched. This created great sympathy for African-Americans. Of course, Martin Luther King was one of the greatest orators in American uh, history, and you saw all the time King on the uh, media. Moreover, starting in the 60s and the 70s, you start having popular films with uh, Sidney Poitier, Spike Lee, in the 80s. So you have African-American filmmakers making popular films. I was raised on rock and roll. In the uh, 1950s, I went to uh, concerts of uh, Alan Freed in the Times Square in Brooklyn, Paramount. So I watched uh, Fats Domino, Little Richard, Chuck Berry. So I loved you know, black rock and roll music. So I think that the media culture really promoted a more anti-racist um, uh, movement in the United States, whereas up to this day, there's still racism. So we have a contested terrain. So this is why it's important to study media culture and be media literate, to be able to read the messages of uh, the media and attain critical media literacy. Now, the difference between media literacy, just reading the media, being able to interpret its meanings, its values, uh, its narratives, uh, to know something about production. The difference between that and critical media literacy is seeing the media as a source of power. It's analyzing the system of production. So in the US, it was a corporate media. So corporations controlled uh, film, radio, uh, popular music uh, for many years, and so promoted a corporate um, ideology. Um, excuse me, let me just take a... Ah, that's Okay, so... Um, the system of production, understanding it is very uh, important. So you have a corporate nationalist uh, ideology through the 1950s in American culture. In Britain, you had state media, the BBC. So the BBC uh, cultivated a more cultured British sort of upper class 
traditional culture, which I think India was uh, colonized by that uh, culture. And France and Germany also had uh, state uh, television. But in the 19... Um, 90s something happened you had cable and television uh cable and satellite television so suddenly you started having a wealth of uh, tv channels of films uh accessible so it became much more of a contested terrain when i grew up in the united states there were just three first radio networks and then television networks abc nbc cbs all controlled by corporations, all the same, middle of the road, not dealing with racism or having racist stereotypes, not having independent women, but women were always housewives and subservient uh, to men, not having strong images of African Americans or Latinos or the diversity that makes up America like it does uh, India. You didn't see this on television until the 1990s and cable satellite television were a wealth of cable uh, channels. So for instance, in news channels, in the 1990s, you got a right-wing news channel, Fox News. You got a centrist, CNN, and then you got an increasingly left-wing progressive, MSNBC. So today, uh, MSNBC and to some extent CNN are strongly anti-Trump pro-Clinton, pro-Obama, pro-Biden, et cetera. So again, it's a very contested terrain between the uh, different television uh, networks. And it's uh, so it's important to know the political economy of uh, production, of uh, what are the sources of uh, media culture, uh, what are the dominant uh, forms. We're now in the internet era where you can get culture from all over the world and from alternative sites, um, which, by the way, I had celebrated, as you said in your uh, lecture, uh, internet culture is more democratic, more diverse, but it also proved it can be very right wing and it can promote Trump. Uh, it, it, the January 6th uprising was all empowered through Facebook. The Russians actually were able to use Facebook to put messages against Hillary Clinton and help elect Trump. So our, our media culture, our techno culture are very uh, contested uh, uh, terrains. Um, now, uh, let's see, I'm gonna try to go just about 30 minutes so I'll have, we'll have time for uh, questions. So I think I gave a good overview of my theory of uh, media uh, culture. Now I need to pay attention to British cultural studies and to articulate my uh, notion of a North American uh, cultural uh, studies. Um, British cultural studies started in the 60s and the 1970s uh, that unlike the Frankfurt School saw media culture as ideological, but saw it more as a contested terrain and saw the spectator that more um, active, that we could resist racism, sexism, homophobia, we could boo Rambo, as well as, you know, cheer, uh, USA, USA. Um, and, but most specifically, British cultural study expanded the concept of ideology and hegemony to include race, gender, sexuality, etc. So I followed uh, that model of uh, cultural studies. But the other thing about British cultural studies it was historically specific. So when I uh, started a North American cultural studies of, with the first volume of my book, Media Culture, with my book with uh, Michael Ryan, who by the way, was the partner of Gayatri uh, Spivak, who's one of the most important Indian American intellectuals. Gayatri was my colleague at the University of Texas, Austin, and Michael would, uh, come and visit her and uh, she would be busy a lot. So Michael and I would go to watch the movies. So we thought we'd 
publish a book uh, together combining my critical theory Frankfurt School perspective in his the French Derridian deconstructive post-structuralist perspective. And we wrote Camera Politica on the politics and ideology of Hollywood film from the 60s to the 1980s. So that was sort of the model for my studies in um, media culture, that you have a very historically specific study of culture in a particular time frame, And you relate the films, the television programs, the popular music to the politics of the era. So for Michael and I, it was the 1960s and all the radical movements, uh, the impeachment of Richard Nixon and uh, Watergate, uh, Jimmy Carter, and then uh, the turn to Ronald Reagan. And during this whole period I've been writing, the US politics has gone from left to right, Democrat to uh, Republican. Uh, after uh, Reagan, you have the Clinton years, then you have the Bush uh, Cheney years. Then you have eight years of Obama. Then you have Trump. Now you have Biden. So it's really been a crazy contested terrain. But the the cultural studies that I do relates the text of the culture to the specific cultural dynamics of the time. So if you're studying Indian film, Indian popular music, Indian uh, entertainment, uh, television, but also news and information. This is another point that I would make that cultural studies is not just entertainment. It's also news information. I alluded to this through talking about the rise of cable networks during the 1990s with uh, a really right wing Fox News and a more progressive MSNBC and even news being a contested terrain. So uh, then, of course, the internet comes along. And this, by the way, is the next uh, stage. I, my latest book uh, oops, wrong one, is called Technology and Democracy Towards a Critical Theory of Digital Technologies, Technopolitics, and Technocapitalism. So we need to study more about critical digital literacy. So the project now is uh, media and critical media and digital literacies to see how the digital culture uh, fits in with media culture, how they've sort of uh, uh, become uh, interconnected. There's a sort of intersectionality, uh, et cetera. In fact, uh, are you um, familiar with the term intersectionality. Uh, my colleague at UCLA, Kimberly Crenshaw came up with that. And it it's, um, argues that the study of identities, of all of our identities are an intersection of gen our gender, our race, our class, our nationality, our religion, that all of these constitute our identities, just like the intersectionality of these ideologies and the histories uh, constitute the history of the US and of in India. So we have to see how the, all of these are interconnected in media text. And by the way, they're often in a very contradictory way. I don't wanna argue that media texts are one dimensionally sexist or racist or progressive or reactionary. They could be combinations of both that uh, media texts like literary texts are polysemic. They have many dimensions of meaning. There's many possible uh, interpretations, um, et cetera, that you could uh, give to them. So um, I think I'm going to conclude on that uh, vein. Uh, you see my analysis of media uh, culture, how it builds on but differs from McLuhan and the Frankfurt School. McLuhan just discussed the forms of media, and I'm obviously discussing the content and the politics and the ideology. Frankfurt School discussed the politics and ideology, but not gender, race, class, sexuality, which British cultural uh, studies did. I was very fortunate to actually meet Stuart Hall, and there was a cultural studies conference 
on cultural studies and postmodernism at Urbana Conference in Illinois in the 1980s. So I was introduced to cultural studies, postmodern theory, uh, et cetera, in the 1980s. So I was very fortunate by the conferences you know, that I uh, went to at this time in, in terms of shaping my work. Just as earlier, I was shaped uh, in my study of Her Herbert Marcuse by meeting him at conferences, at lectures of, at Columbia University, meeting Angela Davis at Radical Philosophy Association uh, conferences, et cetera. So conferences can be very important in terms of uh, cultural transmission, um, et cetera. And it's kind of weird now that we're in Zoom culture, but at least it's giving you some uh, contact with um, people from different parts of the world and you meet people that are writing books and uh, giving lectures and we get to meet you and to have discussions and learn from you and your ideas. Both Charles Wrights and I, uh, adopt a Paulo Freirean uh, philosophy of education, that education is not just lecturing, where you lecture for an hour and then say goodbye, but you also engage in uh, dialogue with the students. So to move to the Freirean mode, now I look forward to your questions and a discussion. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Kellner. I, uh, I'm so glad that you brought up Paulo Freire because we had Henry Giroux also as one of the speakers oh. uh, earlier uh, as part of this series. So it's only Absolutely. fitting that you actually, you know, you they did talk about the pedagogical aspect. But thank you so much, Professor Kellner. You've taken us through, a, you know, an overview and a journey of from oral literacy to, uh, to you know, currently making a case for critical digital literacy. And I think it's so important what you highlighted, which is the, the political economy of uh, you know, of, uh, of uh, the systems of production of media are so critical and important for us to understand uh, and to engage with rather than simply, you know, uh, get get bamboozled by the spectacle or the mega spectacles okay. as you, as you talked about. So I think, uh, and, and, you know, Professor Kellner, I, I think we uh, really wanted to have you so that, you know, people could ask you questions and, you know, and, and like you said that, you know, a dialogue is very important and a, and a uh, and dialectics is somewhere at the heart of uh, you know of our, of, our, of, our, of our thinking as well. So so I think uh, it's only fitting that we're, that we should have probably the opportunity of talking to you and asking yes. questions and and that's so generous of you and so kind of you, Professor Kellner. So thank you so much uh, for your for your uh, for your lecture. And now I pass on my my, uh, my the baton to uh, to my dear friend and colleague uh, Sakshi Dogra, who will uh, moderate the session of questions and answers uh, for. So uh, thank you again, Professor Kelna, and uh, such a pleasure and such an honor to hear you. Sakshi? Thank you so much, Professor Kelna, for that very engaging lecture. Uh, your argument that media culture is best understood when seen as a contested terrain really opens the realm of uh, cultural studies to a whole uh, new uh, uh, you know, terrain of possibilities. So thank you so much for that uh, tolling lecture. I can see that uh, our, our audience are very excited to interact with you. And I was wondering, uh, so how would you like to uh, go about the Q&A? Shall I perhaps club uh, a couple of questions and pose yes. them to you? Yes, that sounds good. All right. Um, uh, I have a question here by Dr. Adwar Shah, who says, uh, Professor Kellner, thank you for such an intellectually stimulating talk. I think in the South Asian context, alternative media or social media, barring a minuscule class of critical netizens, have shaped a media landscape that is somewhat akin to propagandist and statist mainstream media. Therefore, it doesn't seem to bring a counter power or an effective alternative to the mainstream media. Can there be some new alternative to this kind of already corrupted alternative media to establish a more democratic dynamic? Okay, that's, a, that's an excellent and very, very important uh, question. Obviously, I have not studied social media in India, but I know in several different countries, social media is actually controlled 
by government propagandists who uh, use social media to promote, you know, right wing ideology. I pointed out how even in the US, Trump and even Russians were able to use social media to um, attack Hillary Clinton and to promote racism, Donald Trump, and all sorts of divi divisions in US uh, society. And all I can say is it's up to those of us that want a democratic future, actually that want a future at all. We haven't mentioned yet ecological uh, crisis. Uh, we're now in the worst ecological crisis we've ever been into. I've been watching the TV uh, presentations of the recent uh, conference in uh, uh, Glasgow, and they've just not been doing enough to address the global uh, ecological uh, crisis. So uh, again, we need alternative media to uh, promote the truth to tell people you need groups of apology groups. You need groups of media critic people. So it's actually up to you to form groups. Like when I was uh, a young professor, well, when I was a young student at uh, Columbia University, we demonstrated. You know, we went out to the Vietnam War. We didn't have any alternative media, so we could only make our voices heard by uh, going out and demonstrating. And by the way, while I was there, I heard Noam Chomsky uh, lecture about the Vietnam War, who became the most important critic of American uh, media and foreign policy during my lifetime. So Noam Chomsky traveled around the United States giving lectures about the uh, Vietnam War, and we helped uh, organize groups to protest the Vietnam War, to fight it. And finally, the US got out of uh, Vietnam, um, et cetera. Uh, when I uh, went to uh, the University of uh, Texas at Austin, uh, alternative media groups uh, formed. I formed this group that had a public access TV show, Alternative Views. There were others that did alternative uh, radio. There were Latinos. Austin had very many Latinos, a group that had uh, used public access TV, uh, alternative radio, who had uh, art exhibitions, uh, cultural events, uh, brought in films, etc. So it's up to people. So in India, it's up to you to uh, organize alternative media uh, group to speak up about the ecology or any of the political um, um, issues. And it's going to take very different forms in, in very different cultures. So I can't really talk about Indian culture since I've never uh, lived there. It's, it's just that uh, in the United States, actually in recent years, we had Black Lives Matter. This was the most important anti-racist group since the civil rights movement. We had the Dreamers, that was a Latino group of people, immigrants from Latin America who dreamed of becoming US citizens. And they you know, promoted their uh, message. Uh, Bernie Sanders uh, organized a Bernie Youth where he'd go out and say, do you want, who here wants a revolution? So he was promoting democratic socialism that I never heard in American uh, uh, politics. No one, it was socialism when I was growing up was the enemy, the Russians, you know, the Cold uh, War. Now I was very lucky. I went to uh, De Denmark my junior year abroad when I was still a young philosophy student. And I would say I was sort of a libertarian. I was an existentialist. John Paul Sartre, Camus, uh, et cetera. I was apolitical. So I came to uh, Copenhagen. The uh, first time that I got a flu, I went to a doctor, free medicine, great. I lived with a Danish uh, family, a working class family. All their kids got free education, great. The father was about 60 years old. He was retired on a pension early retirement, full pension, nice little middle-class house, nice little garden they have, 
great. So what's wrong with socialism? And as it turned out, one of the, my classmates there was a um, daughter of his girlfriend. I'm sorry. One of my classmates' girlfriend was the daughter of one of the richest guys in Denmark. So I got to be invited to their house with even rich people. Said they didn't mind paying high taxes to have this good society in Denmark. They said, sure, some of the people are greedy, but there's good Danish citizens that are glad they have these uh, institutions. So I never thought social, from that time on, I always thought socialism was good. If it's free education, free medical, uh, free pension, uh, et cetera. Uh, so anyway, that, that answers my question about politics and organizing just with some of my own examples that you you will have your political experiences and you will form your political organizations uh, a similar uh, question from uh, zahid from malaysia who says uh, professor i'm zahid from malaysia can you please elaborate more on how we are going to have an effective contestation or counter hegemony in the media sphere when the media itself is owned by the powerful capitalists? Well, again, it's the alternative film, video, music, radio movement. In US society, people like Spike Lee, who became the most successful African-American filmmaker in the world. He began as an independent filmmaker, financing his own films, making films on a very low uh, budget. Michael Moore, who became our most important documentary uh, filmmaker, again uh, made his films first on a very low budget. He then, of course, became more popular. So you have to start off uh, through independent media for the, precisely the reason that the questioner gave, that yes, the media are uh, owned by uh, corporations and they're not looking for radical black people, Latino people, women, um, guys like white guys, like radicals like Michael Moore. But these people can form their own movements. So our Latinos, our Native Americans, our women, our gay and lesbian people, they all formed alternative cultural uh, movements. Some of them became very popular. And then of course, because they're capitalist corporations, they wanna make money. So Spike Lee's films make more money than most people. So, okay, they give Spike Lee money and he's made film after film after film. Uh, Michael Moore's films make money. So Michael Moore can make, and likewise with many women uh, filmmakers, Latino filmmakers. So again, you start off, uh, if, if you're radical, you know, as a person of color or a woman or a, a radical of any sort in the alternative media cultural sphere, but then you try to break into mainstream uh, media. Um, so, for instance, uh, I could never be on American television. Noam Chomsky was not ever on American uh, television. There's been documentaries made um, about him, but uh, you, you do your own lectures. Now in the world of Zoom, I can go to Ukraine one day, India the other day, San Francisco and another. So it's possible. Uh, to promote critical ideas through alternative uh, media, whether you're an older lecturer like I am or younger uh, activists like uh, people in Black Lives Matter, the Dreamers, the women's movement. Thank you, Professor Kellner. We have another question here by Bharti Arora, who says, thank you, Professor Kellner, for your lecture. Even as we try to negotiate the culture of spectacle propelled by mainstream cultures of production, how do we negotiate 
how do we negotiate say for instance the ways in which people across europe have been dealing with information on and around covid-19 most of the people who have registered vaccine hesitancy have said they no longer trust their respective government and its propaganda either on the disease or its vaccine how do we then initiate a critical dialogue or alternative media in this context i couldn't think of a more important question like all the questions are of fundamental importance so i congratulate you for a brilliant uh question the covid uh vaccination problem is one of the biggest problems we're facing in the us and it's a global problem we can't get certain people to get vaccinated i got my final booster shot the other day i was joyous i was happy when i was a kid uh polio was a disease that was crippling and killing young people of my uh, generation uh when jonas salk did the polio vaccination it saved my life and the lives of other you know people of my generation so i saw science and vaccinations and medical help as good so what you need is information literacy now particularly during the era of donald trump the biggest problem with the media is disinformation and misinformation Trump was a master of misinformation disinformation which makes it all the more important to do media critique and to have critical media literacy to critique the lies and the disinformation and i have to say that some of our newspapers like the washington post or the british guardian uh they made records of trump's lies i forget how how many lies i mean it was thousands of lies so every time trump lied there would be uh, a critique of it and there would be websites uh containing it discussing etc and it's the same thing now with covid and misinformation um that um basically there's a struggle between science and myth or information and disinformation truth and lies by the way you mentioned i'd written some books uh with steve best on postmodernism for which truth is a social construct and it's always contested and it's not absolute and i agree with that but it's more important now than ever to find the truth and to speak the truth and to base all of your information on good evidence on on the truth the truth is not something we can dismiss now it is it's our lives depend on it covid whether vaccinations are good or bad is a question of life or death if you're anti vaccination and you don't get vaccinations you're likely to die you're likely to kill other people in your family your best friends etc so never before has science truth the frankfurt school was critical of science positivism that all knowledge comes only from science that only medicine and physics and biology can give you the truth not philosophy art well i disagree with that i'm obviously a philosopher i i think media culture can give you the truth as well as lies literature can give you truth as well as um ideology science can give disinformation as well as information but it's so important to uh, base your um your behavior on true information especially when it concerns your health and again i have to come back to the environment this is such an important uh issue that covid and the environment strike us as two crises of the present moment that threaten the human race i mean these are scary just as i was uh, about to retire after 50 years of college teaching suddenly covid comes and schools are locked down so this was terrible i was looking forward to go los angeles was locked down i was looking forward to go to museums to go to movies to meet people in restaurants to you know travel 
and everything shut down. So it's, it's been the craziest uh, period because this is a pandemic that has been, you know, the worst pandemic of my lifetime, this COVID. And I know in India too, it's a very, very serious uh, problem. So we have to fight these people that are anti-vaccination. We have to give our own stories. We have to give the medical scientific based evidence that shows vaccinations are uh, uh, good. By the way, I saw a question pop up that I'm tempted to answer. Someone wanted to know what I thought of McLuhan's The Media is the Message uh, today, which is another great uh, question. So again, I half believe in McLuhan. Yes, the medium is the message, that today Zoom is the message. Zoom is enabling us to talk, enabling me to uh, lecture, et cetera. Um, but it's also important what we talk about. It's important what questions you ask, what information that I give. So the medium is not just the message. The message is also the message. In other words, it's very important to analyze the form of media, whether it's Zoom or the internet or books or television or popular music. They all have a historical specificity. But uh, so the the me medium is very, very important. And McLuhan's brilliant at analyzing uh, media Form. His understanding media is the starting point for any serious studies of the media uh, today. But he's just wrong on not talking about the content, the politics, the ideology in the media. So that's my position on McLuhan. Thank you, Professor Kellner, for that very elaborate and rich response. There is a question uh, on, on post-humanism, transhumanism, subjectivity uh, in our, uh, our media culture. The question is by Shraddha Singh. She says, thank you for your engaging lecture. As we move towards cyber culture, taking over, our, uh, taking over all aspects of life, are we post-human or transhuman in our current ways of disembodied engagement, especially in our classrooms that are online at the moment? <laughs> well, I like to think that we're humans, but on the other hand, I really uh, respect uh, Donna Haraway, who wrote the famous book on uh, cyborgs and has... Uh, uh, talked about uh, post-humanism and transhumanism. And if I look at myself, um, I had very bad um, eyes. I first discovered I had bad eyesight. The first foreign film I saw was Igmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal. And I can't read the subtitles. I'm sitting in the front row looking up at the screen. So I discover I need glasses. And I got thicker and thicker uh, glasses. But then I learned about um, eye operations. And uh, I, so I got, uh, I'm forgetting the technical term. So I was able to get uh, basically new uh, eye operations, um, et cetera. So more and more, you're becoming one with your uh, technology. Herbert Marcuse in his last years had an artificial uh, heart. Uh, people that are harmed in war, they sometimes have artificial, you know, legs, um, et cetera. Uh, but also, uh, more and more, we're becoming one with our technologies. So the more I interact with my computer, the more, tr and not people. See, here, here, although we're operating in a sort of transhuman cyborg uh, realm of virtual uh, media, still I see your faces, uh, I can get your questions. Uh, so th there is a human component. So I don't wanna think we're, that humanity is gonna be completely lost. They're, we're gonna be completely cyborgs. But more and more technology is forming and shaping our bodies and our uh, lives. But that's why it's important to be so critical of technology and media culture because it's shaping our life. I told you my new book is on technology 
and democracy on technopolitics, technocapitalism, because technology is shaping everything. So it's important, more important to become uh, techno literate and see how it's creating maybe new, new people. Thank you, Professor Kellner. There is a question by Professor Anuradha Ghosh, who teaches uh, uh, English literature at the Department of English at Jamia Milia Islamia. It's more like a remark. She says, your rich body of work is very inspiring, Professor Kellner. With shrinking democratic space, there seems to be a fragmented and truncated social and political movements in local or microspheres with little hope for the old internationalist orientation. Critical media literacy or modes of crowdfunding and popular participation ushers in the possibility of democratic media. Thank you, Professor, she says. Actually, I myself am an internationalist. I've always been an internationalist. I've always traveled the world. I have always been interested in global uh, cultures. I've taught in uh, Taiwan. Uh, I've taught in uh, Finland, Sweden, uh, Denmark, uh, Germany. Uh, I've gone down and lectured through Mexico, Argentina, Latin America. I would love to come someday to uh, India, one of the few great places that I haven't been. So, and that's why I'm interested in global issues like uh, the climate uh, crisis, like the globalization uh, that was spreading from the 1990s to the present with corporate capitalism destroying sometimes local economies, um, et cetera. So on one hand, we have to be aware of the local, the global, but we also need to be aware of the local where we live. So I've always tried to combine macro politics and internationalism with localism and micro politics, whether it's teaching, whether it's doing alternative media, whether it's working with political groups, whether it's having study groups, you know, working locally in your community with uh, other uh, people that this is very, very important uh, to do. And this can affect certain kinds of change. But we also have to realize at once we're local citizens, we're national citizens. So I'm responsible for whether it's Obama or Trump, I have to you know, give my, or Biden, I have to give my voice and speak out on national politics. But I need to speak out on global politics too. Wherever I talk, I need to talk about the global uh, environmental crisis because this affects everyone in the entire uh, uh, world. So I think we need to live and talk and act locally, nationally, globally. Thank you, Professor Kellner. If you let us impose a little more and perhaps uh, pose a question or two more, because I okay. can see that the chat box is brimming with questions. Uh, Monim Ahmed asks, much of the media that we consume is determined by algorithms that we know drives individuals towards outrage, fear, and consequently radicalization. How would you suggest we counter this momentum that seeks to turn our personal knowledge ecosystems into eco into eco chambers <laughs> this is another great great question that's one of the most disturbing issues that I've encountered first of all I'm not a technical guy and don't know that much technically about algorithms but I've read about it and I know that this is uh, happening. Facebook is separating people into tribal cultures according to what their views of politics or religion or gender issues or racial issues are. So more and more social media that I was hoping was going to be a democratizing force is becoming a tribalizing force in the bad way of separating people into uh, groups. By the way, I never enjoy joined Facebook, even though I'm an alternative 
media um, activist. I hated Facebook from the beginning because I guess, you know, I'm a philosopher. So friendship is important. So Aristotle on friendship and, you know, different philosophers have written on friendship. And my friends are one of the most important things in my life. I see Charles Wrights, who I've been friends with for decades. I had meetings with my other Marcuse friends who uh, yesterday uh, we had a board meeting who I've been friends with for decades. It's so wonderful to see friends. Friendship is so important. So Facebook. You're a friend because you say something that you agree with. So I like Donald Trump and you friend me. I don't like Donald Trump. Uh, you unfriend me. And so friending and unfriending is crazy. You know, that this Facebook notion of friends just strikes me as uh, nuts. But what's worse about it is what we didn't know about these algorithms of how Facebook is getting all this information, which they can sell to marketers, but which they also steer people to groups that, that um, encompass their liking that could that become more and more extreme, right wing or left wing uh, groups. So this is terrible. So maybe the last question now. Sure, Professor Kellner. Uh, there is a question by Jabrin Sana uh, uh, who says, how do you understand, and it's a connected question, how do you understand individual rationality and negative thinking in the social media cultures? Should we think that the great refusal is still possible in the social media space? Well, in some ways, I'm a very orthodox member of the Frankfurt School of Adorno, Marcuse or Keimer, because I believe in critical rationality. I believe in negation. Uh, I believe in the power of negative thinking. And I believe in the politics of the great refusal. So again, critical rationality you get through study. You study philosophy, you study religion, you study culture, you study uh, history. Negation is critical. It's to say no. So when I was young, I had to say no to the Vietnam War. Our um, chant was, hell no, we won't go. We didn't want to go to the Vietnam War because we, we had nothing against the Vietnamese people. We didn't want to get killed and die. We didn't want to harm them. So we said no. Uh, women uh, to sexism, they said no. Uh, African-Americans, Latinos to racism. No. So uh, this negation, this great refusal, is, has been important during all my lifetime and is still important today. So we have to refuse and to speak out against, demonstrate against, organize against. So I think we have to do the great refusal. And all these are open to us as individuals. Now, it can be dangerous. And it's possible I might not have gotten a job because I was too radical. But I ended up getting a job, University of Texas, Austin, then uh, coming to UCLA. So if you uh, do your work and you're impassioned about your research, your writing, uh, your politics, uh, your great refusal may lead to a great life and a great career. <laughs> and uh, we, can only, we can only hope so. And I wish you all the best. I thank you for all these uh, wonderful questions. Charles, it's wonderful uh, to see uh, you. And uh, I'm happy to come back to meet with you uh, with a Zoom in a future time or if we're lucky, come to India. Thank you, Professor Kellner, for those very elaborate, very engaging and very encouraging uh, uh, responses. Uh, I mean, I can still see so many questions in my chat box, but sadly, we have uh, run out of time. Uh, uh, if Professor Malhotra would like to, like to add. 
No, 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 no. It's perfectly fine, Professor Kellner. We don't want to skip you. I mean, it's very, very early still. And, and you know, thank you so much. You've been so generous with uh, with your time. And, you know, you, you've, uh, we are so lucky to really have you. But I'll, I'll pass on the formal, uh, the, the baton formally to Zara Rizvi, uh, my dear friend and colleague, and she will, uh, uh, de- will deliver a proper vote of thanks. So, but we are really grateful, Professor Kellner. I mean, it's been such an honor and such a privilege and, and such an honor really and such a treat to actually have Professor Charles Wright with us. So, I mean, that's been a double pleasure for us. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Malhotra. Good evening, everyone. It has been such a wonderful event indeed. Hello. And on behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone who has made this event so successful. First and foremost, a huge thank you to our speaker, Professor Kellner, who's been so kind to us by giving us so much to think about. We will no doubt be talking about today's discussion for quite some time into the future. Thank you for lending us so much of your time and for sharing your work with us. As always, thank you to our HOD, Professor Sidney Malhotra, who's the leading force behind this lecture series and today's talk. Thank you also to Suman, Shraddha, Sakshi, and everyone on the organizing team who are responsible for running our events so smoothly. And thank you to our audience, everyone who tuned in today from all sorts of time zones and places. Thank you so much, friends, and we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you so much, Professor Kelna. Thank you so much, Professor Charles Wright. It's been such a pleasure and such an honor. Thank you so much. Really. And now I, I wish you a good sleep and pleasant dreams because <laughs> yes. you're right at night, right? Yes, right. And we so, wish you a good day. You're just about starting it so early I, already. I'm just about to start day. So I'll go have a good breakfast. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Kellner. And yeah, I mean, I'm really sorry about the time difference, but I mean, 7 30 really It turned energy. out perfect. It turned <laughs> out perfect. I woke up, I was ready to go. Thank you so much, Professor Kella. You've been so generous, so generous. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor Reitz. Thank you. <laughs>